What is up everyone? Welcome to definitely a sort of sad little video. You can probably tell from the title that today I am delivering the unfortunate news that after five years of faithful service, I will indeed be retiring Powerhack G4 Quicksilver and eventually selling the machine. Once I figure out what I'm gonna do and all my plans get straightened out, I'll sell the machine. And we'll talk a little bit more about the selling side of it at the end of this video. So what has led me to this decision? Well, to rewind a little bit and to give you some backstory, I built the Hackintosh in 2015. A lot of you will remember it. It was a big series for me at the time and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's still to this day one of my favourite projects we've ever done on IMNC. It's probably as well one of the most involved projects, if not the most involved project we've ever done because of all of the modification to the case. So I got a standard Power Mac G4 Quicksilver, stripped away all the internals, modified the case to accept ATX components and built the machine up with nice components at the time for a good solid main machine workstation. After a couple of months of back and forth using the Hackintosh a little bit and using my MacBook Pro a little bit as a main machine, once I got the operating system stable in the way that I wanted it to work, that was my main machine. So for the last five years or so, it's been my main and only machine on the main setup, which is the longest running machine ever. Someone tweeted me a little while ago and said, Tom, you've beaten the time that you've used your Mac Pro. So I got my Mac Pro in January of 2011, and then I replaced it halfway through 2015 with this guy. Well, the Hackintosh has now beaten the amount of time that the Mac Pro has been on my setup. So it's the longest running desktop Mac I've ever had. But there is one catch to all of this. It sounds really great. I built the machine, got it running stable eventually, and I've been using it for the last five years. But it's no secret, and it's become a little bit of a laughing point on the channel that I never did update the Hackintosh past the OS version that it was running back in 2015. And the honest truth about this, guys, the honest truth, I was always too scared to do so. I never wanted to break anything because I knew that if something went wrong, if something stopped working, if I started getting random freezes again, I'd need to start troubleshooting and that would be a massive process to go through. Now there is one thing that I've been lacking in for the last five years and that is spare time. And my sporadic at best upload schedule is definitely an indication. I mean, I've got three kids under five. I don't have time for computers to randomly break from an update on a Tuesday evening when I need to do something by Wednesday or Thursday. I need the machine to work. And I was always too scared to press that update button. So of course, the longer you leave it, the worse it gets. If you stay up to date, then you pretty much know what's coming because the, the Hackintosh community is so strong, everything is documented, and you can get away with updating version by version, and you'll probably not run into many hiccups. But the longer you leave it, those updates accumulate, and then something will definitely break when you do the batch update, you know, skip two or three OSs. At that time, it's just 10 times better to do a fresh install. So speaking of a fresh install, three months ago when all of this kicked off in the world and we went into lockdown, I said to myself, okay, now is the time, the only time that you're gonna get to pull the plug on the Hackintosh, get a fresh OS up and running on there, and prepare the Hackintosh for the next few years of service until inevitably the hardware becomes too outdated to use on a daily basis. So that's what I set out to do. I pulled the plug on my boot drives because I knew I wanted to purchase larger SSDs in the first place. I knew these original 120 gig SSDs would be coming out. I also yanked out my GPU and sold it straight away on the IMNC Facebook page because I knew that I couldn't run an NVIDIA GPU very comfortably in the latest version of Mac OS and I wanted to change it out for an AMD GPU. So all pretty straightforward so far. But then came the fun part and that was installing Mac OS and trying to get it stable. Now I've had various Catalina installs up and running on this guy. Maybe five, six, seven different installs that I've done over the last few months, all with a bit of trial and error here and there. But what I haven't done, for those of you who don't know, it is so easy to get Mac OS installed on a Hackintosh. It is straightforward. You can do it in 20 minutes by following a guide online. But what isn't easy is tuning and tweaking the entire thing to be as stable and rock solid as a real Mac. Now with my configuration in particular, I've always had issues with USB ports and I've always had issues with random freezing. It's kind of been the bane of my existence, but once I nailed that back in 2015, I was so happy it was sorted. That's exactly why I didn't want to update. Anyway, to kind of put 
the last three months into a bit, bit of perspective. I haven't touched it for the last month or so because what happened, I had other projects going. And the reason you see the wide shot of my desk here is I wanted to kind of emphasize that I've been doing everything on the MacBook Pro. The entire kind of resurgence of IMNC that you guys have seen over the last three months or so we've been putting out all these videos, I've done all of it on the MacBook Pro. Some of the biggest series we've ever done, the Network Part 7, the big Unify series, some of the biggest videos I've ever edited, I've done it all on this guy, sat here, not even connected to my monitors, just sat here on the desk in a very uncomfortable, cramped little position surrounded by all this junk. And it's kind of opened my eyes. The MacBook Pro is still very capable. It's a late 2013 Retina MacBook Pro. And to be honest, folks, it does not feel and has never felt that much slower than my Powerhack G4 Quicksilver. So I kind of had to make a decision. Now the decision was, do I slog away at this, trying to get a stable version of Catalina up and running on the Powerhack G4 that I'm happy with and continue using it for the next two years or so, and of course dump some money into a GPU and an SSD, so maybe two, three hundred quid all in dumped back into this machine, or do I not get the headache of trying to get a stable Hackintosh working, continue using the machine that's worked brilliantly for the last three months as my main machine, sell the Hackintosh, put that money to good use, and then look at purchasing a new Mac when the Apple Silicon Macs come out. I think the second plan sounds a little bit better, don't you? Now, if I was a truly passionate Hackintosh person, if I knew what I was doing and I was comfortable with it and confident enough with it, and also if I had the desire to learn, then great, I'd run the Hackintosh into the ground. I'd run it until it physically wouldn't run anymore because I'd be an expert at tweaking it and I could tickle it all around the edges and get it working perfectly. But this is my problem. We're all geeks, but we all have specific interests in different areas of our geeky lives. And for me, even though I built the Hackintosh in 2015 and I always wanted to try out Hackintoshing, the software side of it, the actual installation process of macOS on the PC components and getting it all to work, it's always been something I've seen as a chore. Right from when this first started giving me issues in 2015, I was like, right, yeah, this is not for me because it just doesn't interest me enough to learn more about it. And I get frustrated with it and there's nothing worse. And I wanted to dedicate time to projects that I was more passionate about, which is exactly what's happened over the last three months. So you've seen some nice videos that have come out and they kind of wouldn't have happened if I was constantly slogging away at trying to get this thing to work. So time is valuable and I don't want to plonk away on the Hackintosh trying to get it to work and suck away all my time. Now yes, there's, there are people out there that could get this thing up and running stable within a couple of hours. I know that. And I'd like to give a big shout out to someone who has helped me one hell of a lot. A viewer of mine named Julian reached out to me via email a few months back asking about the Hackintosh scenario, saying, what's up? And I explained everything to him then, explained my plan. And Julian, we, we've had dozens of emails back and forth. He has helped me through loads and loads of different processes with this thing. He introduced me to OpenCore, and OpenCore is, in my opinion, absolutely tremendous. I haven't been using any of the old traditional Tony Mac stuff with this guy since trying to get it back up and running for the last three months or so. I've been trying to use OpenCore, and OpenCore is fantastic. Fantastic, but I still can't get this thing to blink and work properly. So you guys can probably fill in the blanks for yourselves and figure out exactly what's gonna happen. Now as a quick little description, we're gonna make two videos. We're gonna make this one, which is gonna be the farewell to the Hackintosh. And I always like to document this stuff. So the Hackintosh deserves its own video to say goodbye. And we're gonna make a kind of part two to this where we'll be transforming my main setup. We're gonna get the old Griffin elevator stand back out and get the MacBook Pro rocking as part of the main setup hooked up to the main displays and whatnot. And that's the basic plan. I'm gonna use my MacBook Pro as my main machine until I can afford and until they come out. And that is of course buying a new Mac. So um, yeah, quite interesting. I'm not excited about doing that yet. That is something that will come further on down the line once I'm out the other side of all this. And I'm hoping to use the money that I raise from this to maybe start the pot of savings for the new Mac. But we could be talking about a year away. So potentially I have been toying with the idea of using the money that I make from the Hackintosh 
to maybe improve IMNC in another way, potentially look at a better camera and audio solution, something like that. I've got a lot of different little ideas. We'll see which one comes true. But another big thing, of course, is I can't stand still on this because every day that ticks by, the components on the inside of this guy are getting older and less relevant. I need to sell it while it's still a fairly speedy machine and before it is deemed ancient, I suppose. Let's uh, stop babbling and an example of the audio becoming really poor, I do apologise. Let's pull this off the main setup and I've kind of hijacked all the stuff that was plugged into it or at least some of the stuff that was plugged into it on and off over the last few months. As you can imagine, I've needed access to various things, especially the interface for recording audio for the networking videos and stuff like that. Superdriver haven't needed, believe it or not. And a quick thing to address, I've made videos about the two Contour products. There's not a lot of room in this chair here, is there? The Contour Design G-Riser and the G-Rack. And I did say during the G-Riser video that I'd be redoing the main setup and incorporating the G-Riser on the main setup because I think it looks gorgeous. Don't worry, because if you haven't seen my previous video where we unboxed a lovely G4 CPU, I'm gonna be using the Contour Design accessories with the G4. So they will still be put to use, they just won't be on my Hackintosh. Because I won't own a Hackintosh anymore. Which is still something that I'm feeling sad about. Again, not because it's a Hackintosh, but because it's a lovely custom case, one of a kind. That I really did work hard planning, building, but the most important part about that is I have the video series, that's the most wonderful thing. I have that series of videos that I made and I'll have those forever and it'll always remind me. So as difficult as it is gonna be to say goodbye to this case, if I don't wanna run a Hackintosh as my main machine, it's not viable for me to keep it. Okay, here we go. The removal of the Powerhack G4 Quicksilver. And the emotions are starting up now, folks. So there is the kind of gaping void that the machine has left. Horrible, absolutely horrible. It's my favorite thing to see a Power Mac tower sat on a desk. I think it looks wonderful. G4 sat on top of desks right next to you. The design is stunning. I often, over the last few years, of over the last five whole years of using the machine, I just look over at it sometimes and just go, yeah, that is a stunning case because the Quicksilver is my favorite Power Mac case design. So I think the best way for us to proceed is with a little bit of handheld camera work. So apologies if it's a little rough around the edges, but it's the only way that we can take a really good look at this machine, I think. So now that I've got it down and I'm actually feeling and holding it again, it is really kind of emotional that I've made this decision. Um, whether I'm 100% certain or not is not really my concern at the moment because no, I'm not 100% certain that I want to sell it, but I know in my heart that it's the only logical reason because this is the alternative. It's not going back on the main setup because I don't have the time or patience to get it running as smoothly as I want it to run. The MacBook Pro can do everything that I ask of it right now, albeit a little slow, but it's perfectly adequate. So if I do decide to keep this, it'll be gathering dust on a shelf, It'll only be kept for sentimental and nostalgic reasons, and I mean it's a very large thing to keep for those reasons alone. And this is probably worth a fair bit, at least enough money for me to make quite a bit of a difference somewhere else on the channel. So it's awkward and very sad, but I know that I kind of have to get rid of it. So let's try and be a little bit less emotional for this next part because it's gonna get kind of mundane fairly quickly if you gotta go through the whole video listening to me kind of um, moaning, I suppose. But one thing I was always really chuffed about with this machine was on the handle here, this rubber portion, a lot of these are now yellow when you look at Power Max. They've yellowed over time for various reasons. This one is still lovely and clear, kind of whitish gray, looks gorgeous. And the overall condition of the machine is really nice. I haven't had any kind of accidental drops or anything like that since building it. Of course, when we come to the back, the back is kind of different because the back is a complete laser hive kit. Um, a decision that I, I really don't regret, actually. I know it's very, very possible and, and quite easy to modify the stock back of a Quicksilver, or any Power Mac for that matter, 
to achieve the uh, the ATX stuff, but I'm glad I went with the laser hive kit because it's nice and clean, albeit a little bit less stock. But yeah, it still looks nice. Um, the only thing I will say is some people can do this and still retain five PCI slots, so that's definitely quite cool. Obviously M80X boards don't have that many, but it gives you another space to put something that may not need an associated slot as well. So um, a USB card, for instance, that's just got a cable to a header on the inside because there's no front USB or something like that, which is something that we installed first of all in this, but I removed it in favor of an actual USB card because of the USB issues I was having with the motherboard itself. This is a look around the machine. No, uh, no zip drive slot. That was a name that I was going for as well when I was looking for the Quicksilver to use for this. And the Apple logos aren't scuffed up. I always forget how good can, how good of a condition this machine is in. Little scratch there, I think maybe. Yeah, you expect that sort of thing though, I guess. Let's have a look on the inside. <laughs> and this is where you really see that, damn, it is not a Quicksilver, is it? <laughs> Completely custom hardware. So let's have a little tour around this thing. It's been five years since we've been in here and I want to be able to look back on this video. So let's go through absolutely everything. So the motherboard itself sitting on the door is a Gigabyte GAZ97MD3H. And I had to look at that model number on my phone. You'd think I'd know it off by heart now because if you build a Hackintosh, one thing you'll constantly be doing is Googling your motherboard for various reasons, to access its manual and to find forum topics from other Hackintosh users with the same motherboard to see if they're running into some of the other little random issues that you can't seem to figure out. It's a lovely little M80X board. One thing that always kind of annoyed me about it was the slot layout and the fact that you had the two old school PCI slots there. The, the PCI Express was always quite limited, so I had the GPU in here, of course, dual slot and then I had only one PCI Express slot available here. So I had a USB card in there, so I had no option to add um, any more PCIe stuff. So it would have been nice to have that flexibility. But then again, I didn't really need the USB card. I had it in there for pure laziness because I could only get a couple of the onboard ports up and running properly. Um, so yeah, you know, just more signs there that I'm not really cut out to be a Hackintosh guy. Um, the CPU in this is an Intel Core i7-4770 non-K edition, so you can't overclock this guy. It's the standard 4770 quad-core i7, 32 gigs of RAM, 1600 megahertz DDR3, and the cooler on this guy is a Cooler Master all-in-one liquid cooler. Um, can't remember the model number or anything like that. It's a single 120 mil rad. reason I bought this over a Corsair all-in-one liquid cooler at the time. I think in the reviews that I'd seen, this was performing better than the Corsair equivalent model at the time for a single 120. It's a bit of a thicker rad. And also I preferred the design of the block and the mounting. And yeah, it, it must have been, it must have had good reviews in comparison at the time for me to buy it. And it's been a rock solid cooler. This system is quiet. It's, it always has been quiet. I've got a single Noctua fan on the underside of it there. There's some modification done to the case underneath in order to give it some breathing room. And then we've got a second Noctua fan here in the place where you'd normally have one for the Quicksilver. I put a little grill over that as well, which is quite nice. So when you close up the case, You've got some airflow coming in there and there's some modification to the side of the case there also because the cage that is usually around the Quicksilver fan is completely gone. I've spun this round to get a little bit more light into the back end here. Now these are my two original SSDs. I'm going to peel them off right now and I'm going to leave the Velcro on the back wall but I'm not going to be selling this machine with any drives because these drives aren't worth that much anyway and whoever wants it can add their own drives and it just saves me trying to securely erase them and stuff like that. And they'll be handy for other projects for stuff that I wanna do in the future. So they're my two drives. And then this drive is the drive that I've been using. These, by the way, still have the 2015 install on them. So these were used together in my Hackintosh as the main system drives for that entire five years. Then I added this three months ago, just a 250 gig 830 for my experimentation drive. So the plan was, once I got stuff up and running and stable on here, I'd then splash out on a new fast SSD and um, and do a clone and get and uh, get this one out of here. So this was kind of like my experimentation SSD. So 
that's the three SSDs out of the system there. And originally I had two WD black drives in here. I eventually put those in Doom PC because I was no longer editing on spinning drives. I was editing on an external SSD. So I did have a two terabyte RAID 0 scratch disk in here for all of about 30 seconds, but got rid of it. I just didn't want the vibrations and the noise, but you know, two blacks in this enclosure with no padding and stuff like that. It was crazy rattly. That's the original stock Quicksilver drive mount. I wanted to retain that. The cool thing about this machine is you've got SATA power and data, two, yeah, two lots of them here for the back wall. You've also got two lots of SATA power and data here. So if you put two drives in that caddy, you can have up to four SATA drives running in here with all the cabling that's already run neatly, well, relatively neatly. Um, speaking of cabling, we've got extension cabling for the 8-pin and the 24-pin. There's all the SATA cabling connected. And you can see the extension joins here into the PSU harnesses, which go all the way up um, in a neat bundle here and some down the middle and whatnot to the Seasonic power supply. So I just look back at my video and it's a 760 watt 80 plus platinum Seasonic PSU. I remember I went a little over the top on the PSU because it's got a great fan curve where unless you're using over a certain amount, the fan doesn't kick in at all. So that contributes to the silence of the system. Obviously this hardware is a walk in the park for a 760 watt PSU as well. Um, no uh, GPU in here. It's completely missing, as you guys can see. So usually I'd have a GTX 960 in here, but it's nowhere to be found. I did indeed sell it. So when I sell this system to somebody, it's like a bare bones system. And the way that I see it is, if someone was to buy this computer, it would be for the case. It, the hardware is kind of a bonus at this stage. It's still relevant hardware, so if they wanted to add a drive and a GPU, they could get a really nice little Hackintosh up and running, and it would be in a gorgeous case. But the case is a lot more special than the hardware. So if you take this motherboard out, it's standard MATX underneath. You can just screw in any MATX motherboard so you could get a really, really capable Hackintosh up and running in this thing. Now, the only limiting factor that I can really think of off the top of my head for this as a Hackintosh, as a blazing fast Hackintosh, is the GPU clearance. Now, there's a lot of length in the case here, but these pipes, these water pipes from the all-in-one cooler here, will become a little bit of a problem for a longer GPU. Now, when the door is open, they're very stiff and they're not they're not stiff at all when the door is shut because there's loads of length. So if you did put a really long GPU in here, you probably wouldn't be able to have the door flat because these have to go around the back of a GPU. So it kind of sits there. The 960 was really short. So I was looking at an ITX AMD card to go in here, but yeah, that never happened. And then a couple of other basic things, really. We've got this ugly cable. I was always meant to sort this out, try and sleeve it or something along those lines or hide it a little better. This is the custom front panel connectors that are plugged into the motherboard here for um, the original power button and LED that work on the front. So this is the Quicksilver power button. That works to turn the system on and the LED also illuminates. But that's the, the kind of core of the system. We've got a couple of things going on here that I can remove these LED things. We don't need these. And this entire Molex harness could probably be ditched. If drives weren't going in this caddy, then they could be ditched. Another cool thing is as well, I'll unplug that in a minute because I can't do it with one hand. That was just for some underglow LEDs that never worked out, as you guys know. Another cool thing is I've got all the original boxes for the majority of these components. And, um, you know, the, talking the PSU specifically, all of the modular cabling that I'm not using, I still have it all. So whoever buys this, I'll send them off another box full of boxes, a box of boxes to go along with it. So they'll get the machine and they'll get the, the component boxes. It's a nice, nice system. Um, if I was doing it now, I would probably do a few things a little differently. Hardware choice would obviously be different because this is five or six years down the line now. But still, considering I was a lot younger and considering that I did kind of rush into projects back then with not a great deal of planning because I always had a load of enthusiasm and maybe only sort of 70 or 80% of the research to back up that enthusiasm. Um, considering all of those things, I'm still kind of really happy with the way that I did all of this. With maybe the exception of some of the cable management is a bit shoddy um, and, you know, just neglecting stuff like this. But I mean, once I was using it, I was happy, you know. I didn't see any of that, obviously. So I'm going to close this guy up and it closes really nicely. Hard to close a power mat case with one hand. It does need an additional push on the corner there to get it to close because you've got to adapt quite a lot about this door to get this up and running so 
to, to retain the mechanism is quite is probably the trickiest process. So one thing I want to do is replace the screws in here. They didn't come with uh, blanking plates and obviously I had every slot filled. So what I've actually done is somewhere on my very messy desk, here they are, look. They're the four screws to go back in. Now these are the cards I removed. We've got the Firewire card and I had a Firewire card in there, standard PCI for the whole time because I had um, a, an iSight webcam at the beginning and then I had a Firewire audio interface and I used this all the way up until I got the, um, where is it, Focusrite and that's USB so I didn't need the Firewire card anymore. Didn't really gain anything from removing it because it was the only thing a PCI bus was really useful for. Um, and then this is kind of what saved my ass as well. I bought one of these guys, the uh, PCI Express USB card. It gave me all of those USB ports and they were the only USB 3s that I used because this card was plug in play. So I feel a bit more comfortable now. I've got the screws back in their rightful place. I don't want to risk losing them. So to close off this video, because I could easily make it really dragged out and rambly, but that's no fun for anybody. What I want to try and do is avoid the whole eBay thing. What I'd prefer to do is have a discussion with somebody that was genuinely interested in buying this and talk about things like the price and stuff because it's such a unique item I'd struggle to be able to put it on eBay knowing what to list it for um, same goes for if I wanted to put it on my IMNC Facebook shop I really don't know because the hardware that's in it is not the most valuable hardware anymore but the case that is really up to you as to how valuable you think it is for me it's priceless because it's custom and it means so much to me but obviously you've got to kind of put a price on it and I know that it's not a machine that's going to make me a huge amount of money but I think the money that I get from this will be able to be put back into the channel in definitely a positive way it'll definitely have a positive impact I would want a decent amount for this guy to make it worth getting rid of. So there's nothing much left to say other than bye bye Hackintosh. This has been a solid machine for five years. It's been my main machine. It's done absolutely everything for me. I'll be so sad to see it go, but excited at the prospect that it'll hopefully be going to a very good and happy new home. One thing I'm gonna do for certain is instantly start work on the next video and sort this setup out because that empty void is upsetting me. So we need to rejig this setup, make it all nice again. And I think that'll be a definitely more fun video for you guys to watch. But this was a necessary video to make. I want it in the IMNC catalog. So it's here for me to look back on. Hope you guys have enjoyed this video and understood what my reasonings are behind this. I know there wasn't a lot to enjoy, but I had to document it. So thank you so much for watching. And um, yeah, I think we can all just say, Bye bye, Powerhack G4 Quicksilver.